Welcome back. Good to see everyone. How many of you came in and recognized that immediately? Okay. I mean, I'm seeing a... Well, no, I don't mean recognize it as a map. I mean, where's that from? How many of you recognize exactly where that's from? All right. I figured there'd be a few. And, uh, and how many of you thought when you got here, Tim Bowman must be preaching? How many of you thought that? I know those conversations happen too. I'm not supposed to have visual aids, but I do this evening. Our lesson title, you can see behind me, What Must I Do to Be Saved? This is our last one in our question series, uh, important questions that have been asked in the Bible. And this is the last one. It's lesson number 11, if you've been counting. And um, we couldn't leave this series without talking about this one. This one is so important. We have to talk about this. It is the greatest question ever asked in the Bible. And so we're going to begin looking at that. I want to begin with something rather simple. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. One of the most recognizable quotes in the New Testament. And many people will quote that when it comes to what must I do to be saved. They'll quote that verse and then they'll just walk on their way and they'll ignore everything else. And just quoting that verse and walking away from the subject misses so much. It misunderstands so much. It leaves so much unsaid. And so we want to develop this this evening. The salvation in view in our title question is about salvation of the soul. This isn't about being saved from financial ruin. This is not about being saved physically from some danger or disease or accident. This is about salvation of the soul. That's what we're talking about. And this is including recognizing right and wrong and finding the answer to the wrong that we've committed, to the guilt that we have before God. And only the truth is going to set us free. John 8, verse 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truth is from the source of God, and He reveals it to us through the Bible. John 17, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. Only God holds the remedy to our sin and guilt that separates us from Him. Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, about this to my right. I have fond memories of the still being used Jewel Miller Visualized Bible Study Series. And this goes back to 1956 when Jewel Miller and Texas Stevens got together and co produced the film strip series to be used in personal evangelism. And it involved five lessons the patriarchal age, having to do with those individuals in the book of Genesis, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Job in the book of Job having to do with individuals like that. Lesson number two is the Mosaic Age taking us from Moses and the giving of the Ten Commandment Law, the nation of Israel through the Old Testament all the way really until we're through the book of John. And then you have number three, the Christian age that officially begins in Acts chapter 2. We'll carry through to the book of Revelation and we'll cover all of the remaining time and history of earth. Lesson number four is God's plan for redeeming man where salvation is discussed. And then you have lesson number five, history of the Lord's church that will begin with the New Testament pages and the church beginning there and going through much of the history for a couple thousand years and, uh, and, and talk about 
why are there so many churches out there? Where do they all come from? How many were there in the New Testament? Why are there so many now? What's going on with all of that? And uh, so those are the five lessons in the Jewel Miller series. And I still remember this illustration from lesson number four, God's plan for redeeming man. And it has to do with the answer to our title question this evening. Someone may wonder, and they'll go through their Bible, and some will pick out a passage like Ephesians 2 and verse 8, or Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, or some other passage that talks in some singular way about what a person needs to do to be saved. And they'll pick out, and they'll, they'll say, well, some are told one thing, and others are told something else. You go to this passage, they're told this. You go to that passage, they're told that. And why are there different answers to the same question through the New Testament? Some are told they need to believe. Others are told they need to confess Christ. Others are told they need to be baptized. Well, why is that? Why are there so many different answers? And Brother Miller had such an easy way to explain that, and this is it. He had such an easy way to explain it. And if you watch that film strip series and you had the booklet that went along with it, there was this picture, and you see it on the screen behind me, and you have a man in a 1950s vehicle. I remember seeing that color interior. And uh, there's a man in a 1950s vehicle, and he's got a map out. By the way, if you've never tried to unfold one of those in a car while you're going down the road, that is a chore and a trick, and whoever the navigator is in the passenger side, they get it all over in the way of the driver. And then if you ever try to fold one of those things back up, good luck. It's hard in a car to get that thing back the way it's supposed to go. And we don't use them anymore because we have our phones and we have GPS and we just listen to the voice tell us which way to turn and when. But you don't learn the road the way you did with that. If you used one of these maps, you learned the road to where you could just drive it and not even think about it because you followed your traveling on that map and you learned the roads and you learned the turns. But when all you do is listen to that voice in your car, you don't learn the way. And if the voice goes away, you're lost. So that's the way we used to navigate in a car. And so it had that picture. And then there's a man there, and it's the center picture on the screen. That's a gas station. And there's a man there who had a cap on. He had a white shirt on. He had a uniform in the gas station that he wore. And you'd go in there, and he'd have a map out there for you, and he'd help you find your way on that map. And then you have this illustration in the third frame. And this is the one I've recreated for us this evening. Brother Miller in the Jewel Miller series had this question in the film strip. But is it possible for a person to know whether or not he actually is a Christian and that God has added him to the church? Or in other words, is it possible for him to know just how near he is to being saved? The Bible answer, yes. Yes, he can know. And he goes on to explain it using a road map like this. And there's an individual, this man is traveling from California to Florida. And so his question on the map is, how far is it to Florida? And he would get different answers at different points on the map. And you see that on the farthest part of this, you have him starting out in California. How far is it to Florida? 2,310 miles. But he goes to Utah, and he says, how far is it to Florida? Well, it's 1,840 miles. But he gets to Oklahoma, and he says, how far is it to Florida? It's 960 miles. And then you get all the way over here. How far is it? 400 miles. The answer keeps changing. Why? He's at a different place on the map. He's being given different distances, different answers to the same question because he's traveled through some things but has other things yet to travel through. And so the answer is different. And it's that way in our Bible. 
that's the way it is when we look in our Bible. You have the same thing. You have people who, when they're the furthest away, they're given one answer. You need to believe. Other passages will tell people, you need to confess the name of Jesus. Other people are told you need to repent. Other people are told you need to be baptized. And so there's different answers, but those who are being told to repent and be baptized have already repent or already confessed the name of Christ. They've already heard the saving message. They've already believed it to be true. And so they're being given a different answer because they've traveled a different distance in that direction. If you look at a passage like Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. He hasn't even started the journey, much less completed it in baptism. So you have a passage like that that makes perfect sense when you understand the road map of salvation in the Bible and all these different places that you have to pass through to get to the destination of what must I do to be saved. That illustration of Jewel Miller was so easy, so appropriate, and when people have that kind of question today, I still use this illustration because it's so perfect and it helps them to understand what's going on there. So you have a person like Cornelius in the Bible. What's he told? He's told, send for Peter. Send for Peter and he's going to come tell you a message by which you will be saved. You need to hear a message. That's what Cornelius is told. That's his beginning place in the journey. You have Romans 10, 9, and 10, and the emphasis there is about believing and confessing in the process of salvation. You come to a passage like 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, and it's going to focus on godly sorrow and repentance. You look at another passage like Acts 2 verse 38 and Acts 22 verse 16, baptism is the emphasis because other things have already been accomplished and that's what's left. So it depends on where you are in the journey toward salvation being offered in Christ. The rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18 came to Jesus and said, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer he's given is different from all of those because he's at a different place in the journey. Do you remember the answer Jesus gave the rich young ruler? He told him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. That answer isn't even on this map yet. That answer is over here. He needed to choose a master. He needed to choose a voice to listen to. He needed to choose an authority in his life. So he's given an answer that's different from all the others because he's at a different place before he can ever begin that journey. So when you understand that, then you have an understanding of this road map to salvation in the New Testament. Only when you get the map Will you understand the different answers in the New Testament? They're all part of the one answer. It is the same answer for every individual, but some have traveled one distance and some have traveled another in the journey. But it's the same answer and it has multiple stopping points along the way. But it's the same answer. We just need to learn how they all fit together. So when you collect all the answers together and then you begin to sort them out in their logical sequence, one thing will naturally come before another. You can't believe anything if you haven't been told anything. If you haven't heard the message, you can't believe in it. So the message is going to come before believing. And once you believe the message to be true, you're going to understand something about Christ. And you're going to be able to confess, to admit that He is the Son of God. Having done that, you're going to understand you sinned against Him and you're going to want to repent of your sins. One thing will naturally come before another. Collect all of the answers that are given, sort them out in their logical sequence, and then you find the beginning point, connect all of those things together until you arrive at the final destination in Christ and your sins have been forgiven. 
First, though, we need to understand the need for the trip. And for that, we go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis begins in the beginning, and it describes the created design of God. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and morning the sixth day. And man and woman are with God in the Garden of Eden. They're in fellowship with God, and everything's great. And then sin enters. The tempter comes, and they choose to sin against God, and they begin to hide from God. They're separated from God, and they begin the dying process, being separated from the tree of life. Here's the need for the journey. That's why we need to make the journey, what must I do to be saved? When you get to Exodus and Leviticus, it begins to unfold the idea of the holy nature of God. And you'll find holiness to be a big theme there. In Exodus chapter 3, you have Moses, and he's coming up to this burning bush, and the Lord tells him, get the sandals off your feet. This is holy ground. You're coming before God. And as you travel from there on into the book of Leviticus, you're hearing all these rules and regulations and ordinances about how to approach God and this and that and the other thing and sacrifices that need to be made because God is holy. And you violated His holiness with sin. And so you need to approach Him in a certain way. And holiness is emphasized. 1 John 1, 5 is my favorite New Testament passage to summarize that. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. He is pure and holy and we are not. We need to make the journey. We need to find forgiveness of our sins so that we can be holy like our God and be back together with Him the way they once were in the Garden of Eden. Old Testament history begins to develop the family of Abraham. It's through Abraham's family that God would introduce the Christ, Jesus, the Son of God. He would be born into the family of Abraham through Joseph and Mary. And so the Old Testament is developing the family of Abraham as the vehicle to bring Christ to the world in Bethlehem when he's born to Mary and Joseph at that time. Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus that connects him from Abraham all the way to his birth. That's the way the book of Matthew begins to say, here it is. Here's what the Old Testament was developing. Here it is in actuality. Jesus is born and he's of the lineage of Abraham. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that introduced Jesus, the price he paid for our redemption to make it available to us. You come to a great passage like 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 19. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. But how does one obtain access to the precious blood of Christ? What must I do to be saved? If I'm redeemed by the blood of Christ, how do I come into contact with the precious blood of Christ? How does that take place? And this is where we begin to follow our New Testament roadmap. It's the reason the New Testament doesn't end at the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the sacrifice has been made, the precious blood has been spilled, there's the answer to it, but it doesn't end there. There has to be a road map to tell you how to get you from your lostness into salvation. How do you contact the blood of Christ? How do you apply it to your soul to remedy your sin problem? So it goes on from the book of John. 
And when we ask the question, what must I do to be saved? The first answer we need to recognize is the answer is something. I need to do something. If I'm going to be saved, I need to do something. It's not that Jesus did it all and I just need to accept it. There's something I need to do. Now the first thing we want to do at this point is locate the map in our Bible. Where is the map? Here's the map illustration. But where's the map in the Bible that takes me from being lost to being saved? The book of Acts is the beginning of the New Testament church from Acts chapter 2 and forward. And you will find there the collection of all of those who are saved. All of those who have made that journey to be in Christ. Acts 2.47, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And it's going to give a history. The book of Acts is a history of people moving from being lost in sin to being saved in Christ. So collect all of those. Search through all of those. They form your road map in the Bible of what must I do to be saved. And you will collect all of those key, po the key points that are pointed out in all of those conversion histories. Collect all the key points and put them in their logical order. In Acts chapter 2, as it first begins, they're hearing a message preached by the Apostle Peter about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Hearing the message is in the beginning of the journey. They come to believe that information about Christ that Peter's preaching. They believe that information to be true. And their confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is implied in the text. It is implied they are confessing He is the Son of God because they cry out, as they're pierced to the heart, men and brethren, what shall we do? They've realized the one they've just crucified is the Christ, the Son of God. And so they cry out recognizing who He is. They're pierced to the heart in godly sorrow. Acts 2.37 actually says they are cut to the heart. They are pierced to the heart. They've developed godly sorrow over what they've done. And they ask what they must do. What shall we do is equivalent to our title question tonight. What must I do to be saved? And Peter responds, there's something you need to do next. There's something that comes next. You've heard the message. You believe the message to be true. You are admitting that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then he tells them in verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That gets you to the end of the journey where you are in Christ and you've been brought from being lost to being saved. They did certain things already. They cry out, what shall we do? Peter tells them how to complete the rest of the journey with repentance and baptism. Now you take all of that together and the whole process is summarized in verse 44. Those who had believed. They are now believing ones. And so being a believer becomes a summary term for doing all that they did from being lost where they were crucifying the Son of God to hearing the message, believing it to be true, knowing that Jesus is the Christ, repenting of their sins, being baptized. Now they are believing ones who have been saved by the blood of Christ. That's the journey in the Bible. That is the Bible map. And you're going to find numerous histories of people being saved from Acts 2 and onward throughout that book. And they'll be told to do one or more of those things depending on where they're at in the journey. But baptism is the final step that puts one in a saved condition in Christ. And the letters that follow, we talk about the epistles, we talk about the letters. After you get book, past the book of Acts, you have Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and onward from there. Those letters are like legends to reading the map. They are explanations about the turns and then how to live in Christ. 
What must I do to be saved? We want to find that question in text. We want to locate that question in text and understand it as it's being asked. In Acts chapters 13 through 28, you have Paul and his companions on three missionary journeys. They're going out and they're going into the New Testament world and they're preaching the same message that Peter preached in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. They're preaching that everywhere and they're doing it in three waves, three missionary journeys. We come to Acts chapter 16 and Paul and Silas are on the second missionary journey and they find themselves in the city of Philippi. And through a series of events, because of their faithfulness to Jesus, preaching the gospel message, they are beaten, they are thrown into jail in Philippi, and they're put in stocks. A torturous device to make you as miserable as you can be and inflict pain. So they find themselves there, and in the middle of the night, there's a great earthquake. And the prison doors are opened up for every prisoner, not just them, but for every prisoner. And chains are loosened, not just from Paul and Silas, but from every prisoner they are. Acts 16, verses 27 through 30, when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Because if you are a guard and you lose your prisoners, the penalty is your death. And he was ready to fall on his own sword, supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, our lesson title, What must I do to be saved? And there it is. There is where we find the title of our lesson tonight. His physical life has already been spared. He's not asking, what must I do to be saved, about physical life. It's already been spared. He's asking about spiritual life. He's asking to hear the same message Paul and Silas have been preaching in the city. He wants to know about salvation of the soul the way they've been preaching to everyone else. Acts 16, beginning in verse 31, they said, because of where he's at in the journey, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Get your foot on the journey. You need to begin in the beginning place with this. And you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him. They had to preach a message so that he could believe in it. And if he believed in it, it would propel him to the next step in the journey. And so that's what he's told to do. They preached the message to him, and he took them, the jailer took them, Paul and Silas, he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. You know what that is? That's repentance in action. Instead of being beaten, instead of being in the jail, instead of being in those miserable, torturous stocks, now he's washing their wounds. He's had a change of heart and direction of life. This is repentance in action. And immediately he was baptized, he and his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole house. You need to believe, now you are a believing one. When? When he heard the message, believed it to be true about Christ and who Jesus was, had repentance in action and was baptized for the remission of his sins. Now he's a believing one in the same sense as those in Acts 2, verse 44. The answer is the same for everyone. We need to hear the gospel message about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We need to believe that information to be true, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, to develop godly sorrow for our sins and come to the place of repentance and to be baptized for the remission of our sins. The question that we all need to answer is, 
where am I on the journey? Where are you in this great journey? What is your next step towards salvation? And how can we help you this evening? If you are subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.